You're listening to the Balanced Educator Podcast, episode number 172. Welcome to the Balanced Educator. We're your hosts, Kaylee and Josiane from EduCalm. Our intention is to equip and empower you to feel more calm, balanced, and joyful in all aspects of your life. Are you looking for strategies to improve classroom management? A great place to start is by teaching emotional regulation skills to your students so that they can self-regulate and better manage their behaviors. But how do you teach self-regulation skills to kids? Yoga and mindfulness is a great way to teach emotional regulation to students in a fun and engaging way. Hi, it's Kaylee here today, and in this episode, I'm interviewing Giselle Shardlow from Kids Yoga Stories. Kids Yoga Stories was founded in 2012 by classroom teacher and trained yoga instructor Giselle Shardlow. Through her travels and teaching grades K-5 to in Guatemala, Australia, Canada, and the United States, Giselle witnessed the need to address childhood literacy, obesity, and stress. She blended her passions of yoga, mindfulness, and education to create books, card decks, courses, and educational resources to bring the benefits of yoga to children everywhere. In this episode, we discuss what is kids yoga and how is it different from adult yoga. We talk about how to teach yoga to kids and teens and how to bring yoga and mindfulness into the classroom. We talk about how to make yoga and mindfulness fun for kids so they'll actually enjoy it and want to participate. And finally, we discuss how to prepare for bringing mindfulness and yoga into your classroom or your school and really easy ways to get started. Now, before we dive in, here's a word from our sponsor. Do you want to incorporate social emotional learning and mindfulness into your classroom to support students with mental health, focus, self regulation, and emotional intelligence? With so much on your plate as a teacher, you probably just don't have time to get trained, develop resources, and teach the lessons yourself. Plus, you need time for self care too. That's why we developed Educom to support teachers like you. Educom is a fully bilingual English and French co-regulation program created by teachers. This program provides everything you'll need to build self-regulation, mindfulness, and social-emotional skills with your students through a five-minute daily practice. With Educom, you don't have to be the expert. Just log in, press play, and participate with your students as you all prepare your minds and bodies for calm and focused teaching and learning together. Go to educalm.com to learn more and start using our free resources. Again, that's educalm.com, spelled E-D-U-C-A-L-M-E. And now the interview. Enjoy! Hi, Giselle. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thank you. There's nothing better than hanging out with like-minded people, don't you think? Oh, it's so fun. It's so So fun. fun. It's like, it just grows my heart three sizes. I can feel, I can feel myself being filled up. It's such a good feeling. I love it. (laughs) So Giselle, let's jump right in. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. Let's get started with who are you and what, how did life lead you to where you are today and what you're passionate about today? Excellent. Thanks for asking. So I guess I could sum it up with that yoga has always been a part of my life. So my mom, I grew up in Winnipeg, south of Winnipeg, um, where you are, which is so exciting. So we had a a farm and we used to watch, my mom used to watch yoga on television when I was little. So it started there. And in my twenties, I used to go to classes with her. And then I took teacher training in 2005. So I guess almost 20 years ago. And, you know, from there, you know, I was struck with this idea of writing yoga stories. So that's kind of like that thread. Yoga has always been in my life and more intensely now as a, as a grown up. And at the same time, always worked with children. So I, you know, coached as a figure skating coach, right? And then I was in day camp and then I became a teacher and I traveled to different countries as a um, international primary school teacher. So it's always been a thing for me. And then when I finished, well, my daughter, I had my daughter. And she was nine months old or so. I thought, I want to bring these passions together, you know, while while she's while she's napping, right? So yeah. it became kind of like a nap nap time passion, bringing together my passion for education and working with children 
and travel. And so here we are 12 years or so later, and I'm living, living the dream, Kaylee, totally living the dream. I love what we do. And I'm just so excited to be able to share this mission of helping children with self-regulation and managing big emotions and being ready to learn in the classroom. I love that. So I love that you got to learn yoga with your mom. That's so special. Tell me more about that experience. What did yoga give you as a young person? And why did you stay connected with this practice as you got older and then want to share it with your own daughter? Well, I wish I could say there was like some light bulb moment when I was little. I don't, I don't really remember. It was just something mom always told us we did. And I found the book that of the teacher that she had way back when, but it wasn't really till my twenties did I really find it, it was useful. I mean, even in university, I remember showing up to a class and feeling super awkward and weird and not really sure what it was all about. So it wasn't until later. So it wasn't, wasn't really that acceptable. I suppose, or that we knew about. Yeah, we it wasn't that yeah. common at that point yet. Yeah. It was still a really new thing, like in Canada for yoga studios and things like that. Yeah. There, there weren't very many at that point. I think for the lesson for me is that she planted a seed. You know, mm-hmm. like she passed away recently, but she was practicing yoga in a way that she could up until the end. Like we would wow. do chair poses and breathing and, you know, doing some meditation together. I wrote a book about meditation. So it was something that was always a thread in our life. Yeah. Not that she was like a diehard yogi, but it was just something that was always there. You know, it was like that practice that you could come back to as a tool. Yes, exactly. And I think that's what we, you know, as educators, that's what we have to remember. We're planting seeds in the classroom, right? I love that you mentioned that because sometimes as teachers, when we're teaching mindfulness, yoga, these types of practices, coping strategies, breathing skills, um, it can feel kind of disheartening sometimes when you don't see the effect that it's having on your students immediately. Um, But remembering that this is like a seed that is planted and then as they get older and those emotions get more intense, stress gets more intense. They're like, oh yeah, I have this thing that I learned when I was a kid. I have kind of a similar experience that is just coming back to me now that I almost completely forgot about was that I used to be a gymnast when I was a child and young teenager. And uh, I, my teacher had given me, like my coach had given me this like relaxation tape to help me fall asleep at night. And so I would listen to it at night and it was like a body awareness, like a body scan. So it would say like, notice your toes, relax your toes, notice your feet, relax your feet. And that was really kind of my intro to this body awareness relaxation. Like, oh, I can actually choose to relax my body. Like that's something that I can do. That's, and yeah, that was planted. I must have been like 10 years old or something when I started that and, and just grown from there. That was the first seed. (laughs) I love you saying that too, because I have the same experience as a figure skater. So I, I was a figure skater forever a competitive skater. And my coach was the same. We never, she never said, let's practice yoga mindfulness. It was always let's do visualizations or let's yeah. do some meditations. Exactly like that. It was much more normalized, I feel like, right? Back mm-hmm. then. And it, and I think that, again, is another lesson for us to think about. This isn't anything new, yes. right? This is not new. Not only do we have proof of the Yoga Sutras that was written 5,000 years ago, but it's something that is just about being human. It's It's secular. It's available to us all the time. It's it spans across all all religions, you know. So there's no there's no barriers. There it's just mm-hmm. about being being a human, learning to breathe well, move well, and know how like your thoughts, words, and actions, right? Yeah, totally. And I I just remember kind of points in my life growing up where this realization of, okay, I can have control over my body. Like it doesn't have to control me all the time. There are things that I can do to manage how I'm feeling, whether that be like an emotion or like physical pain because I was an athlete growing up and there was generally some sort of pain happening in my body I was right. dealing with injury and things like that. So yeah, noticing that like even with physical pain, there's something that I can do to like manage the feelings of pain as just, it's been this great tool that I've had throughout my life. And it started with these little seeds at a young age. Yeah. So let's talk about like 
how, why is yoga good for kids? And why do we want to introduce this when they're young rather than just waiting till they're older and can like get into it more, you know, cause young kids don't necessarily, they don't experience the yoga practice like adults do. So why would we want to start when they're young? Right. Yeah. So let's think about the things that concern us, right? And so different yoga is different than another sport, for example, because it affects their social, emotional, the mental, and their physical well-being, right? And so just quickly looking at that, right? Emotionally, we can use breath and mindfulness to work on anxiety, reducing anxiety, reducing stress, right? And so all those big emotions, anger, depression, all those things, right? And then mentally, we use it specifically in the classroom for focus and attention. We're using, again, the breath, mindfulness, some chair yoga movements, you know, different shapes. Physically, super important. I feel like even more so now, right? We have uh, grown these sort of hunched over, you know, not so physically fit children because of the screen time and the pandemic. So flexibility and strength and core and and strengthening all these kinds of pieces that also really helps them in their sports and other activities as well. And also social, right? It, and it gives us this opportunity to tune in. So we become more aware of what we're saying, what we're thinking, how we're behaving, sort of taking a pause, you know, and it has better uh, relationships, right? This character education that we we study with the children, our, the yoga principles, allows us to connect and cooperate on a deeper level, right? So I think that's looking at that as a well-being. I'm sure you've got more to add to that. Right? Yeah, no, I love yeah. what you said and how it spans different areas. And I also really appreciate that you related it to sport. I think that's something that we haven't talked about, especially not on the show, but how you know, this practice of mindfulness yoga, like we can think of it as a sport. And that's actually something that I teach a lot in workshops at schools, because I almost always have a question from a teacher being like, well, what if there's a parent that doesn't want us teaching mindfulness in the classroom or doesn't understand what it is and thinks it's a religion? They don't realize that it's a secular practice. Right. Um, I always give the example, I say, well, think of mindfulness like a sport, football, for example. So, you know, you might see a football team praying before a football game or thanking God when they um, get a touchdown. That doesn't mean the sport is religious, but those people are welcome to bring religion into any aspect of their life. You know, football is the sport and then they bring to it whatever they want. And the same is true with yoga and mindfulness is mm -hmm. that it is a secular practice, but some people bring prayer into it. Some people bring aspects of their religion into it. And they're welcome to do that. Um, but what we teach in the classroom is the secular version. <laughs> so yeah. we're not talking about you know religious aspects. We are talking about the mind-body connection just as we do in any other sport. So yeah, that's a cool way to, of looking at it. And as you said, we're developing different aspects of the body and mind with a yoga practice, just as we do, you know, we understand the importance of physical activity and which is why we have physical education, phys ed in schools. Um, and oftentimes classes, phys ed classes have a unit on uh, yoga, which is great because yeah, it's, it's a sport just like others. So <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. great. So now let's talk about like bringing story and what does this actually look like in the classroom with children, with students? How do we bring this yoga practice into the classroom? Does it look like it would look like in a yoga studio with adults or how do we adapt um, what we're teaching and how we're teaching it to be working with kids? Yeah. Well, let's first of all look at, you know, what is yoga, right? And mm -hmm. so we remind ourselves that it encompasses the physical postures, which is the most common thing that we think of or, or see in the in the Western world here, right? So physical postures, mindfulness, meditation, character education, karma, uh, karma yoga, which is a act of service to others, and obviously breathing, right? And so there's lots of components that we can we can bring. So thinking about how that looks different in with children than with adults, for example, let's think about. Um, I'll give you some stories. So. I work in a school with fourth and fifth graders. And when I went to pick up the children from PE, it was, it's a very, um, the dynamic is, is tough in this class, let's just say, right. And so they often uh, get each other dysregulated very easily and it's hard for them to focus. 
at the end of PE, the teacher was saying to them, you know, go lay down and have a deep breath, like a square breath. And I hadn't seen that before. And they all just, and, and she said it in a, not like in a calm way, you know, it was like, go sit down, go like in a PE teacher kind of way, right? Go yeah. sit down, do your square breath. And, you know, and they all did it. They all laid there for a few moments. And I, I mean, I couldn't visually see if they were breathing or not, but you know, that's what they had asked for. But she told me afterwards, she said that they had self-identified that they needed to do that, right? Oh. Incredible. This is something that took 30 seconds. And I tell you, Kaylee, when they came, this is just recently, when they came back into the classroom afterward, they were transformed. Not only did they get the movement piece, but they were able to come down. Their energy was able to come down at the end of PE class to come back in and be ready to learn, right? Amazing. And then I, you know, another story would be for me personally in a classroom where we just did some yoga, chair yoga poses just to create movement. When you have that morning, that long morning black block, oftentimes in elementary, it can be that you have your specials in the afternoon or whatever, however that works out. But you can often have these long blocks and you have to transition. And for children, middle school is great. If you get to transition between classes, you get to get up and move, right? But if you're in elementary, you can have a big block of time. So in the middle, we would do a chair yoga or something like that just to loosen things up. And that was that worked wonders, right, to help them refocus between tra transition. Um, thinking about, you know, stories of how it looks different with some of our, our community members. So we had um, a woman named Amy. She was a guidance counselor. She took our school yoga program. And she started to do mindful morning announcements. And it was something that they did every Monday. You know, the children just got used to it. They would hear all the announcements from Amy. And then the classrooms would do it, do the breathing exercise. One day there was an accident in the playground. A little little friend had to go off in an ambulance and the children were really upset, obviously. So the principal said, you know, Amy, can you go down there and, and help the situation? She went down there and she had a group of 50 children and teachers and she asked them to do a breathing exercise, right? The one they had done together, the figure eight. And so you can imagine what happens, Kaylee. Like you've got 50 people adults and little ones, all of a sudden on the same page, taking a moment to do a deep breath together, right? That is the benefit. You go from a group of children like that in a school who are dysregulated, scared, anxious, worried, and in a moment, they can collectively create an energy shift so that they can calm down and then go back to the classroom. And be ready I to love learn. that. Right. One thing that's standing out to me in these three stories that you told is how in each story, these breathing practices are super simple, only take a couple seconds, but there's something that have been repeated often. So the students know how to do it before we're asking them to use it as a tool. So the, you know, the square breathing in PE class, they yes. knew the drill. They've been doing it before. They, when the teacher said, go lie down and do, do square yes. breathing, like they knew right. what that meant. They were able to do it and be like, oh yeah, this is a tool that I know can work for me. I know how to do it. Um, yeah. In your class, doing these chair yoga exercises, obviously this is something that was a routine. And then with the class doing the, the figure eight breathing as a school, this is a tool that they They've practiced before. And then now in a really scary situation that would have such a large group of little kids and adults alike feeling dysregulated, they can all use this tool that only takes a couple seconds and brings everyone back to a calm state, which is just what an amazing gift to give to students. Right. Right. And I think, I think that's the thing. The thing that I'm sure you hear too, right? From so many teachers say, well, how in the world do I have time? I have enough on my plate. I've got enough going on. How in the world do I add one more thing, right? And so we have, speaking of what you said about stories, so we've got these breathing cards and and they're creative. You know, we look at blind bird breath or eagle breath or lion's breath or, you know, there's lots of different breaths that we can make it fun in a way that we're still, for example, using the extended exhale, which has been proven to calm their nervous system. So you can make it fun. You can create stories out of it. It can be creative and it can be quick, right? And yeah. you might be thinking, how in the world is teaching children to breathe going to make a difference? So our challenge, our invitation, right, to all of us is try it. 
you know, and notice for yourself, right? I mean, even before we get on a talk like this, I do a few deep breaths, right? To calm my body, calm my mind, right? Whenever I go into the class, before the classroom, I take a few deep breaths, create the space, right? It becomes part of your like ritual as an educator. And it was the same for me before this podcast. I was feeling a little bit achy, had a bit of a headache. I was like, okay, I've got five minutes. I'm going to go like five minutes isn't very long, but it's enough time to go do a couple sun salutations, move my body. And then all of a sudden, wow, I feel ready to perform at my best, you know? And as a teacher, if you can make that part of your little ritual, little routine before you interact with your students, it can be so beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So yoga cards, you were, or breathing cards, you were talking about um, all these different animal breathing. That's another thing that's so fun with kids is they connect so easily to animals. And that's one thing that's really fun with yoga is that most yoga poses are modeled after animals and you are kind of asked as the yoga student or as you're doing the posture to kind of embody that animal. And I think that is something that weaves through many different traditions and many different cultures is this aspect Mm -hmm. of connecting with kind of the animal's qualities. And yoga is so fun for that. So tell me more about like different animal breathing and maybe can you guide us through an animal breath? (laughs) Yeah, totally. Wait, just you saying that remind me now that we're because you're on Canadian soil over there. We had one of our, another one of our participants um, in our school yoga program was from the north of, in Ontario, working with First Nations groups. And she worked with the elders there. We created these cards together called the Grandfather Teachings. They're so amazing, right? And she looked at the work that we were doing. She was looking at, wow, how similar it is to First Nations culture, right? And yes. so the, the animals came through in these cards and she's, they're acting out these shapes and what they know through the wisdom of these animals through yoga postures. It's it's just amazing. So as you say, it, it, it goes across different cultures. So animals, definitely for the little ones, for sure. I mean, for the older ones, not so much. They would think we were <laughs> a little goofy. They might not outwardly be excited, but there is yeah. some form of familiarity that comes up when you ask them to, you know, breathe like a certain animal or behave like a certain animal, it gives them something to kind of imagine and connect with when they're doing this breath or posture that is unfamiliar to them. So it brings some sort of familiarity and makes it feel less weird for the for the yeah. older kids, at least in my experience with um, high school students. Yeah, I, I noticed absolutely. that. <laughs> absolutely. Well, well, let's speaking of which, let's do eagle breath. This one, wh- when I was making these up, um, these cards of a couple of years ago, my daughter, who was probably about 10 or so at the time. So she wasn't a little one, but she made it. I said to her, you make up one and we'll add it in the deck. And she knows I love bald eagles. So I'm I'm from Vancouver originally. And we used to go up on the way to Whistler there in Breckenridge. No, Bricken. Anyway, maybe Brick, anyway, we used to go watch the eagles. So a bald eagle. So she says, you know, put your arms up like this. So we're doing our eagle arms. And then when you take a deep breath, oh, you can't see it, can you? So when you're doing uh, like an eagle pose, putting your arms up in front of you, your palms are crossed in front. And this, if you're looking through your hole like an eagle, you take a deep breath in, breath in. And then you take your arms to your shoulder, your hands to your shoulders. And then you breathe out right in and to the other shoulder. Cool. So it's almost like you're giving yourself like a deep hug and then connecting the back of your hands on the inhale. And as you exhale, giving yourself a hug. Yes, exactly. So that's something like, you know, it doesn't have to just be us as adults creating these fun, creative things. It can be the children, like tell us how a, how a bee, you know, so a bee would be, you know, we could do a buzz breath or whatever. So get them involved. Yeah, so fun. I love doing lion's breath with my students because yeah. it starts out with us, with me demonstrating, and then everyone like pees their pants laughing because it's so silly. Yeah. <laughs> and then we do it together, and it's just like a fun way to bring right. laughter and silliness into the classroom yeah. with all ages. I've done it with yeah. kindergarten kids, I've done it with grade 12 students, and with adults. I do that breath a lot when I'm leading professional development workshops with teachers, and it's just, yeah. it's funny. Do you want to explain uh, Lion's Breath? 
Yeah. And what, what's great too, adding that to the pose. So you could be in like a tabletop, you know, in all hand, um, on hands and knees and then, um, bringing your shoulders back and then taking a breath in and your tongue comes out. <sighs> So that there's something about that, and you could do the eyes too. Yeah, so yeah. your eyes can go goofy. Your tongue comes right out, and it's just it's this moment of what what is it? There's something magical about Lion's Breath. It's like a I don't care what my face looks like. So there's a piece of that you got to like surrender, right? Let's yeah. do that again. Inhale in, exhale out with your tongue out. <laughs> so great. I always tell my students to try to reach their tongue as far as they can down and look with their eyes as far as they can up. So it's like you get this whole face stretch, which is really (laughs) nice. And then I always over exaggerate the like, (laughs) make a funny noise to get everyone giggling. Right. I think that that's the thing. What you're what what you're making mention there. It's not just the anatomical. It's not just the breath and what it's doing to your body, but you're also with your mind, you're making it silly and fun and relatable, you know, and it's not like a force thing. It's not something that's hard or, you know, so it's a, it's an experience and collective. So you're having that collective experience altogether. Yeah. And then you can share it, you know, so there's a lot, a lot goes on there in the little crazy lion's breath. Yeah. So fun. So I'd like to know, your advice for a teacher that's just getting started and maybe they don't know a lot about yoga. Maybe they don't practice yoga themselves at all, but they're like, this is something I'd like to bring into my classroom. Where should they start? Yeah. Uh, So yoga, as we talked about the the different facets, it's so broad and you're right. This is something we hear all the time. So in our school yoga program, for example, I'll share with you one of the things that we do as, as part of our program is the first thing is to look at your ideas. So we make this web and we look at the why. So be thinking about what is your why? Why do you want to bring this to children? You know, is it because you've got little ones? You know, what is it little ones who need some extra just movement? Is it older ones who maybe need some more self-esteem or connection? Is it more working with children with anxiety or stress? So I think that why is is super important to start there. Otherwise, it becomes more too overwhelming. But yeah. if you've got that kind of as your North Star, then you can piece it down into who, what's your age group, right? Who, how do you describe the, you know, the economic background, the different cultures, the diversity, the special needs, you know, thinking what is the population that you're working with or that you want to work with, right? And then thinking about the what. So which of these practices do you love the most? You know, is it physical postures? A lot of teachers say, oh, I don't want to practice physical postures in the classroom because I feel self-conscious, right? Mm, Fair yeah. enough. That's why we have so many resources here at Kids Over Stories because we you've got visuals that you can share, right? Yeah. And so like, for example, our books, you're reading a, a yoga story and in it, there's little characters doing the yoga poses. So you don't have to actually do them yourself if you don't want to. The children will will do it naturally. So thinking about whether that's, you know, whether it's the physical postures, the mindfulness, you know, I know at, at Educom there's a lot of mindfulness practices, right? So that's something I'm sure that you've you've um, talked about that you've wanted yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So that's something that's passionate to you. And how are you going to do it? We talk about the where, you know, where are we going to do it? Is it in your classroom, at home, in a gym, outside, library? you know, and then when, so of these sort of like five minute little snippets, is it a half an hour? Is it a class after school whatever? So I think starting from there as a web, and certainly if, if you're interested in learning more, you know, definitely reach out and we can kind of work through some of those ideas with you. We have lots of stuff on our website as well, but I think that's where you start is really paring it down. Otherwise it's just, there isn't a one size fits all. Yeah. Yeah. I really love that planning tool. I think you really hit the nail on the head of the things that we need to think about. And it doesn't have to be complicated or take long to go through that planning process, but just getting a clear idea in your mind is going to make it feel a lot easier to execute because you know why you're doing it and you know how and you know where you're going and your purpose. Um, and that's that's just so important for being able to stick to something that might feel awkward at first because it's new for you. Um, so yeah, that's that's a great way of beginning the planning process. Yeah. And it can be short. It doesn't have to be a total overhaul of your curriculum. It can be, 
But if you just are someone who just wants to add a snippet, like with your videos, right? You've just got five minute videos you play, right? That could be a thing. Or my daughter's second grade teacher used to play two minutes of music right after recess is two minutes of silence. Gold, right? Yeah. That's amazing, right? Just, just that. Or you have a breath of the month or a breath of the week in your school, or you do mindful Monday morning announcements, like I was telling you, Amy does, or, you know, there's lots of different things, or maybe there's like a, with the little ones, kindergartens, you might, or preschool, you might have 15 minutes to do a little yoga practice together, or maybe in middle school, you're doing like an after school program, like an after school yoga mindfulness club. You know, I just spoke to a, a, a class in Edmonton, Canada, actually, and um, they're doing yoga plays. So there's sixth graders who are putting yoga plays together from some of our books and they're going to perform for little ones. So that's so know, cool. Guys, the limit on, on what you can do, but doing this work will help you be more clear and put it into action. Yeah. And realize that you, as you said, it doesn't have to be a whole overhaul. You can start small. It can be, you know, one breathing strategy for the entire month. And as you become more comfortable with that first small step, then you might want to build on it and, and feel more comfortable building on that initial strategy. I love that. So you have amazing resources. Um, you have so many books. So I can, if I were in an elementary classroom teaching elementary, I would definitely incorporate some books into story time, even maybe as, you know, in high school, high school kids like having stories read to them too. It's just so <laughs> unusual for them. So it could be definitely used at any age, but let's talk about how our listeners can connect with you and your resources after this episode, because you have a lot to offer. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So if you want to hear more about our school yoga program that I mentioned a few times, definitely check out our, our website for that. It's kidsyogastories.com. Also our shop, we've got lots of different, hundreds of different um, products, both physical and digital. If you're looking for different themes or different ideas to bring into your classrooms, your homes or studios or whatever. We're on social media. Uh, Instagram is Kids Yoga Stories and Facebook, Pinterest. Um, you could email us at Giselle, G-I-S-E-L-L-E -L -L -E, at kidsyogastories.com. And yeah, we look forward to connecting. Awesome. And we'll put all of those links in our show notes. So listener, you can just go from the app that you're listening on and kind of there's usually a spot where you sort of scroll a little bit and it shows you all the, all the show notes and everything will be linked there. So it'll be really easy for you to connect with Giselle and Kids Yoga Stories. Giselle, thank you so much for being on the show. I loved this conversation. Um, I think that there are a lot of ideas that teachers can jump right into their classroom now and try something out um, and not put too much pressure on themselves, just planting that little seed. Yes. Yeah. And being creative, making it relevant, right? Making it based on your topic or theme or and making it fun. And that is the thing. It's not like a forced thing. It's supposed to be fun. Yes. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kaylee. See you later. And there you have it. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with a friend or colleague that would get value from this free resource too. And before you get out of your podcast app, can you do us a favor and quickly leave us a review? Let us know what you enjoy about the show. Hearing from you just fills our hearts and helps us to feel connected with you. Podcasts are funny in that we don't get feedback on podcast episodes like you do on podcasts posts with social media. So our way of connecting with you is through reviews. So please leave us a review. Those reviews also help other educators, teachers um, to find our podcast as well and benefit from what we're sharing. Thanks again. We appreciate everything that you are doing in the world. You are awesome. And we look forward to chatting with you in our next episode.